We are going to read about grace. We're in Colossians chapter 3. We began the chapter last week and we're continuing with verses 5 through 11. Colossians 3. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them. But now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him, a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free man. But Christ is all and in all. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word and bless our time of study in it together. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Not long after I graduated from seminary in the mid-70s, I had a short-lived career in the clothing industry as a salesman in a local men's store. I was told to read a book that had just been published titled Dress for Success. It's an interesting book. The author was not in the clothing business, but by running tests and using statistics, he came up with the right suits and shirts and ties for a businessman to dress for success. Well, fashions change. I'm not sure you'd want to be caught in one of his power ties today. But Paul has a formula for the Christian to dress for success spiritually that will never go out of style. It's Take off the unfashionable suit of the old life. Put off the old filthy rags of your former life. And put on the fresh, clean clothes of the new life, the Christian life. Wear righteousness. That's the lesson of Colossians 3, verses 5 through 11. It is in the application part of the book. The first two chapters are all about doctrine. And doctrine is always practical. All doctrine has duty. And Paul now gives the duty that follows from the doctrine that he has been teaching the Colossians. That's clear from the first word in verse 5. Therefore, he's... He's drawing the implications of all that he has been saying. He writes, Therefore consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. The King James Version has, Mortify therefore your members, which is truer to the original text, which is, Put to death the members of your earthly body. What Paul is saying here is, be killing sin. Don't allow it to control the members of your body. Don't let passion move your feet to bad places or your eyes to look at improper things. And the reason Paul is giving this instruction is due to what he has just stated in the previous verses and in the first two chapters, which is, we are new people. Believers are not the people that they used to be. We died with Christ. We have been raised with Him. That's summed up in verse 3. You have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. That's what Christ did as our substitute. When He took our place in judgment, when He bore all of our sins and was punished for them in our place, He obtained all this for us. 
And further, Paul says in verse 4, he's coming back. And when he does, you also will be revealed with him in glory. So, be prepared for that. Be prepared for his return. Be living for it. And in doing so, living for the future and living for what is eternal. Not living for what is passing away in this world, but for what is forever and to come. We do that by turning away from our old life. Refusing to engage in the conduct that was so common before our conversion. Really, more strongly, mortifying our members, killing bad behavior. The acts of behavior listed here were common among the Gentiles, and because they were so common, they were still temptations for these young believers in Colossae. The list is mainly one of sexual sins. Immorality wasn't a big deal to the Greeks and Romans of that time. It was really accepted behavior. I got a sense of that many years ago when my wife and I were in the city of Athens and we were walking down the street and there was this very nice store. And so my wife wanted to go in, we went in and she began to look around at all the beautiful things in this store and I wasn't that interested. So I sat down and there was a table next to the chair and there was a, a, a coffee table type book sitting on the table, so I picked it up. It was a book about Grecian urns, Greek vases. And in ancient Greece, this was one of the main art forms. And they would decorate their vases with a variety of scenes, scenes of daily life or other kinds of scenes, scenes of great battles. So I began looking through it and immediately realized that this is ancient pornography. These were vases with scenes of gross immorality. I closed the book and I thought, what is a book like this doing in such a posh store? And then I thought, what this tells you is this is what decorated the homes of the ancient Greeks. They had no shame. Well, that is the world these Colossian, Colossians were saved out of. They had to radically reorient their thinking, their values and behavior. What was acceptable in the old life was completely unacceptable now. Their life was hidden with Christ in God. They couldn't bring that sinful behavior and those sinful ideas and attitudes into their new relationship with the sinless Son of God and with the triune God. So Paul said... Consider yourselves dead to all of that. And he adds to the list, greed. It's like the others. It's like impurity. It's like passion because it too is desire, only it's fixed on material things rather than people. It's not just a desire to possess more than a person has, but to have more than a person ought to have. It's a desire to possess what others have with a fervent desire that's like lust. Some of you will remember Ivan Boski, stock trader in the 1980s who made a fortune with corporate takeovers until he was convicted of insider trading. Famously said, greed is all right. I think greed is healthy. You can be greedy and still feel good about yourself. People would like to think so. But according to the apostle, Christians are dead to it. Greed is idolatry, he says, because it is a life-driving desire and a person worships the things that he covets. He thinks that his hope and happiness and security are in things. And so, he sets his affections on the things of earth rather than the things above. He worships gain as God. That is so common. Calvin put it very well in the Institutes when he stated that the human heart is an idol factory produces idols. And, and the, the fuel for producing the idols is greed. There's no place for that in our hearts. 
We need to kill it, which means kill self-centeredness. Sex and greed, these are the things that characterize the world of Paul's day. They characterize ours as well. Fifty years ago, I think I was in college when I read a little book, and in the book, the author described the age in which we're living as neo-pagan, a new paganism. I think that's an apt description. Well, it's become even more so over the decades since then with virtue being uh, that of tolerance. That's the great virtue of our day and applied to all kinds of sins. We're to be tolerant. In fact, uh, we've even turned some of some vices into virtues. In fact, that observation has been made so often that it, it, it loses effect, I think. And really, the, the reality is it's no different today than it's ever been. Maybe a little more intense, but we've always been in an age like this. Every generation has... Isaiah speaks of that in Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20 where he says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. That's human nature. But it's so common, we're in danger today of being so desensitized to the world that we don't see things as they really are. Desensitized to immorality and materialism that... uh, was such a challenge to those Colossians. Well, we're living really in the same kind of world with the same challenges that they faced. And we have to see what is around us is not normal. It's wrong. But that's difficult. Because the spirit of this age, the spirit of each generation, is powerful and constant. It is relentless It is subtle, and it's always there. And it threatens to press us into its mold. That is Paul's warning to the Romans in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, where he says, do not be conformed to this world. Now that reads very well, doesn't it? Do not be conformed to this world. Mortify therefore your members. Be killing sin. Put off passion. But passion is strong and not so easily put off or killed. So while it reads well, is it really possible? Is it? There's an old story about King Canute. Probably heard it. That uh, may have some application to us. He set up his throne on the seashore and he commanded the incoming tide to halt and not wet his feet in robe. When his feet got wet, he turned to his nobles and he declared how empty the power of kings really is. There are forces at work in the world that are far greater than a king's commands. That illustrates the weakness of the most determined person to overcome the forces at work within his or her heart. The passions that drive him or her. Trying to stop sin in oneself is like commanding the tides to halt. Preaching can't restrain immorality or curb our covetousness. Not even the law of Moses can do that. In fact, that law of, against covetousness, Paul says, what killed him. Power of sin is as as strong as the currents of the sea. We can't stop it. Paul, of course, knew that. Knew it better than anyone. He's giving instruction on morality in our passage, but giving it to people who do have power to overcome sin. Who can, in effect, command the tides. That's what he's teaching. We are new creatures. We're not the old creatures we were. We're new creatures with new ability. The penalty of sin has been removed through the cross and the power of sin has been broken by the cross. That's a reality. In chapter 2, Paul wrote that in Christ all the fullness of deity dwells. He is fully God. He is very God of very God. He is God the Son, not God the Father, but equal with the Father in essence and in glory and in power. 
He's the second person of the Trinity. In Him, all the fullness of deity dwells, and we're joined to Him. We're joined to Him in His life and His power. His life and His power are in us. And we're told that at the cross... He disarmed the rulers and authorities. He he defeated our angelic enemies. That's our position and our power in Christ. And Paul's counsel here for mortifying or killing sin is understand who you are in Christ, that you have died to the old life, to, to to the world and its attitudes and aspirations and goals, We're dead to the old life. We're dead to the old world. And so, when we have the desires of that life, we're to see them as that and we're to put them to death. Kill self-centeredness. Consider yourself dead to all of that. That's not simplistic, but that really is simple. But you find this instruction all through Paul's writings. Find it, for example, in Romans 6 and verse 11. I notice that's one of the memory verses that has been placed in the the bulletin this week. Romans 6, verse 11, Paul says, Consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Consider yourselves to be dead to sin. He's not saying, let, let, think this way. It's not true, but just imagine that this is the case. No, think this way. Consider this to be so because it is true. The way we think about ourselves affects the way that we act. But it, it's not the power of positive thinking that Paul is engaging in here. That, that thinking makes it so. It is true. That's what he's saying. Believers are dead to sin and have power over it. So we're not like Canute commanding the tide to halt. We can turn back powerful forces in us. We can kill sin. We have really died to it. We are new creatures with new abilities. We live a supernatural life. Well, here's how Paul puts it elsewhere. He puts it in Romans 8 and verse 13. If by the Spirit... You are putting to death the deeds of the body. You will live. Now that's what we're to be doing. Putting to death the deeds of the the body, but doing it as we can, can only do it, and that is by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is mentioned in this book of Colossians maybe one time in chapter 1 and verse 8, and there's some debate as to whether Paul is referring to the Holy Spirit there. I I take it as, as referring to the Spirit. But other than that, There's no mention of the Holy Spirit in this book. Take the book of Romans, go to Romans 8. That's all about the Holy Spirit. But here the subject is different. The subject of Colossians is Jesus Christ, His person and work, the sufficiency of Christ. He's the subject. The Holy Spirit isn't. But we can assume correctly, putting our doctrine together, that He is in all of this. His person and work is assumed to be in all of this. We have His power as in this life through Christ. Christ lives in us through the Spirit. And we walk successfully in this life by walking in obedience to Him. Walking by the Spirit. So we can deal decisively with immorality, passion, and greed. And and the seriousness of doing that, the necessity of doing that, is stated in verse 6 where Paul says that God judges those who practice such things. Verse 6, for it is because of these things, these sins that he's mentioned in verse 5, that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience, and in them you also once walked, when you were living in them. In other words, they were once sons of disobedience, but no longer are. They had been saved from God's wrath and from a life that makes a person liable to the awesome wrath of God. 
It therefore makes no sense to go back to such a life, to go back to such a foolish, destructive, harmful life. But it especially makes no sense to practice such pagan vices since they are no longer pagans. And to realize they're no longer heathens, they're no longer unbelievers, no, no longer unregenerate men and women. They're new people with a new nature. They were in Christ. And Christ was in them. They had His life through the Holy Spirit. They had the power, therefore, to live obediently. To live differently. Therefore, they were to consider those facts to be true. They were to look on themselves as dead to the old life, to their former desires and practices, and, and see themselves as they were alive to God in Christ, and therefore live it. The old life is no longer an option. The old life connection to the old world is dead. The believer in Christ is dead to it, and it's dead to the believer. There's no going back. When Cortez brought the Spaniards to Mexico for conquest and gold, he burned the ships on the beach at Veracruz so that none of his men would be able to desert him. Maybe a poor comparison between a brigand and a saint, but here's the point. When you know there's no going back, you go forward. And that's what Paul is saying here. The ship has been burned. There's no going back. The old life is finished. There, there's no bridge between the two worlds. That's what the cross did. That's what Paul told the Galatians. Through the cross, because of what Christ did for him and what happened to him on the cross, when Christ died, he died. He said, the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. The world's dead to me, I'm dead to the world. Saul of Tarsus is dead. Paul the Apostle is alive. I can no longer live like Saul. That is true of every one of us who have joined ourselves to Christ. We have died with Him. The unbelieving, unregenerate person is gone and our life, our new self, is hidden with Christ in God. So live that new life. That's the logic of the Apostle. We do that first by ridding ourselves of the vestiges of the old life like we would an old suit of clothes. And we need to because the desires and the habits of that old life are still with us. That's Paul's instruction in verses 8 and 9. But now you also put them all aside. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another. Now, Paul is writing here to believers. He isn't describing the world. He isn't describing the unbeliever. This is true of Christians. The saints are not always so saintly. It's the problem of Romans chapter 7 and verse 19. The good that I want, I do not do. This is the struggle of Galatians chapter 5 and verse 17. The flesh sets its desire against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. They are in opposition so that you may not do the things that you please. So that you may not do the bad things that you please. The Spirit is there fighting against that. But so you may not do the good things either because the, the flesh is against it too and it's very strong. We're in this conflict with our, our spirit against the flesh or the Holy Spirit as in Galatians 5 against the flesh. There is a great conflict going on. That's true of all of these things that Paul is saying here. All of these sins that he names here in these two lists. This is the conflict we have with these things. He spoke earlier of passion. That is almost always used in the New Testament of illicit sexual passion. But the sins here in this second list are, are passions also. They are sins of the heart and tongue. 
Evil comes out of the heart. And the tongue is one of the heart's most destructive tools. What is in the heart is anger and wrath. And those two words may seem to be similar, synonyms, but they are with a difference. Anger, the word is orge, is a settled feeling of, of hatred and continu- a continuing condition. It, it simmers, as it were, in the heart. Wrath, on the other hand, is not simmering. It's a, it's a sudden outburst of anger. And so a person broods, broods over something that has happened, a wrong that has been suffered until he or she loses their temper and says unkind things, malicious things, harmful things. The the tongue becomes a weapon for that, a weapon for harm and division, speaking slander, attacking a person's character. The tongue is a fire, James said. It's small, seems so small and insignificant, and yet it's like a spark. And a spark can set a forest aflame. And that's what the tongue does. It sets the world aflame. And it can do that in the church of all places. Again, remember, Paul here is speaking to the Colossians. He's speaking to people who are born again. He's speaking to Christians. This is what we do. It's shameful. We are in Christ... But how unlike Christ all of this is, of whom the prophet said, a bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench. He was gentle, never angry, at least never angry in a sinful way. He never meant harm. He never did or uttered a word of harm against another person. He always spoke truth and spoke it in the right way for the right reasons. He's our standard. We fall short of it. But one way we're brought into conformity is by correction. And Paul was correcting these Christians of Colossae as he is right now correcting us here in Dallas. To be like him, that is be like Christ and not yield to our passions. But that is what we struggle with. It's when a sinner is saved that the the battle is really joined. It's not so much when a man or woman is in unbelief. The world doesn't struggle with the sins and and righteousness. This is a battle that takes place when one's born again and becomes a new creature in Christ and has a has a completely different alignment to the things in the in the spirit of the age. That's when the battle is joined, and it is a battle of the titans. The flesh is a powerful force. But remember, we are a new creation. And Paul reminds the Colossians and us of that fact in verses 9 and 10. Don't sin since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self. The person we were in Adam, rebellious, in unbelief, at war with God, that person is dead. We put him off. We are now in Christ. Through faith, we put him on. We're now dressed in Christ. And that affects our behavior. There's a Short story that illustrates this, sort of. It's titled, Clothes Make the Man. It's about three thieves in Paris who plan to rob a house. Two would do the job, and the third, who was not a very bright person, would stand watch in a policeman's uniform. All he had to do was stand there in this policeman's uniform. No one would suspect anything with a policeman standing in front of the house. So they dressed him up, stood him out front while the two were inside robbing. Well, while they were doing that, the third began to act like a policeman. He saluted a passing officer. He helped an old lady across the street. He even kept the peace on the street. So 
he became so identified with his uniform that when his partners in crime came out, he blew a whistle calling the cops and yelled, I arrest you in the name of the law. Well, it's written as fiction and to be humorous, but there is a sense in which it is true. Clothes don't make the man, but they can certainly influence the way he or she thinks and acts. And for the Christian, when we realize that we have put off the old self and put on the new, that we are dressed in Christ, that we're dressed in His righteousness, that has an influence on us. A proper influence. We are righteous sinners, it is true. The Reformers coined that expression, and it's a good one. We are righteous sinners. We are forgiven. We are justified. We are declared right by the judge of all the earth. And He treats us that way. We are His sons, His daughters, His children. But still sinners. And yet we're born again. Believers in Jesus Christ are in Him and a new creation, new men and women. It's as though we're not only wearing a policeman's uniform, we are policemen. Or maybe better, more of a biblical analogy, we're not, we're not only wearing princely garments, we are princes and princesses. We are royalty. We really are. We are sons of God, daughters of God, children of God, heirs of the kingdom to come. We still have the filthy rags of our old life on, But they don't go with the regal robes that we now wear. They don't fit our white robes of righteousness and the new life that we now have. So get rid of the rags, Paul is saying. Put them all aside. Start blowing the whistle on that old stuff. And start doing the new. Live according to who you now are. It's a struggle. Don't mean... To make it sound easy, certainly the Apostle Paul wasn't being glib about any of these things. It it is a struggle. It's a lifelong struggle that we will be into the last day of our life in this world. But it's a reality. We're new creatures. And, And Paul adds three things to his statement in verse 10 that believers have put on the new self. Three things that are very encouraging. And then the first is that the new self is being renewed. The life and power of Christ that is in us, because He is in us, is active and changing us. It is a power that is transforming us. And it is changing us according to a pattern. That's the second thing that's encouraging. It is according to the image of the One who created Him. We're being made like Christ in His image. That's continually going on within us. That's what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 16, a, a verse that the older I get, the more I love it. We don't lose heart, he says, though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. It's not easy getting old. But what's glorious about it is what Paul is saying is while you're getting old on the outside and the inside, you're getting vigorous. So we have ability to obey. And thirdly, we have knowledge, what Paul calls true knowledge, not the fake knowledge that the false teachers were peddling there in Colossae, the myths and the mysticism, the magic that they were proposing. No, in Christ, we have truth. So, we have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. And that knowledge is food for the soul. It's used of God to reconstruct us, to remake the image of God within us. Renewal is a work of the Holy Spirit which he does through the word of God. If you're not experiencing the kind of change that Paul speaks of here, maybe it's because you're not studying the Bible as you ought. Look, if Paul were here, he'd say, I don't feel like I'm experiencing the kind of change that I ought to be experiencing. None of us will do that. 
That's the struggle. But here's the fact and what we need to get in our mind and believe, and that is that Scripture is sufficient for our sanctification and we need to apply ourselves to it and to the degree we do, we will experience change. Now in verse 11, Paul says that it is not only the old life and its sinful habits and attitudes that have been done away with in the new creation, but also the barriers that divide people. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free man, but Christ is all and in all. All the things that separate people are included here. Race, religion, language and culture. The Jews looked down on the Greeks because they were irreligious and immoral. They were unclean. They were the dogs, they said. And the Greeks, on the other hand, had no more respect for the Jews or anyone. They, suffered, they censored everyone outside their language and culture. Anyone who didn't speak Greek was a barbarian. And the worst of the barbarians were the Scythians, the tribes from around the Black Sea. Paul mentions them here as really the, the, uh, the epitome of a barbarian. Many of them were slaves of the Romans. Josephus said they were little better than wild beasts. They were often figures of amusement in Greek comedies, the Scythians. But the gospel breaks down all of these barriers, the the ethnic barriers, the religious, cultural, social barriers that make all of these people separate from one another. It breaks those down and brings them into one people. And that's what the church is. The church is the new humanity. God's grace does what the world can only aspire to and think about and try to accomplish with the United Nations. It doesn't happen. It happens only in Christ. And in Christ, all of these are brought together and are all equal, each with the same privileges and status. There's no distinction, Paul says, between slave and free man. Now that was a revolutionary idea. Aristotle, one of the great minds of the ancient world, called the slave a living tool. Not a human, not a person, not a real person, a tool. And that was the enlightened view on the slave. Christ changes that. He gives dignity to the Scythian and value to the slave. He elevates all people. We are all equal in Christ, His new creation. We are to know that, reckon that to be true, and live it in our relationships with one another. Sometimes Christians are given opportunities to prove it and act on that. That happened in the arena in Carthage in the early third century when the Roman aristocrat Perpetua stood hand in hand with her slave Felicitas. They both faced death together as equals in Christ, and it made a deep impression on the spectators. That's what grace does. That's what sovereign grace does. It's what Christ does. He joins us together in one new humanity. It's what we are to do when we realize that we have put off the old man and put on the new. It affects the way we conduct ourselves, and the way we treat one another. And then, when we understand this, who we are in Christ, we begin taking off the filthy rags of that old life and putting on the holy conduct of one who is in Christ, joined to Him, joined to the Father, and dwelt by the Holy Spirit. And we have conduct that is open, fair, and loving to all. May God help us all by His grace, by the power of the Holy Spirit to do that, to do that daily, because this is a daily exercise, a daily effort. It never stops. We are daily, moment by moment, to be putting to death the deeds of the body and live to His glory daily. You want to be a success 
you want to achieve much in this world, then don't live for this world. Set your mind on the things above, not the things that are on earth. Dress for success by putting on righteousness. Live for Christ. Let me end with the rest of the story of King Canute. It has a lesson for us. He didn't really think that he could halt the tides by a command. He wasn't a fool. He was actually very wise. He was making a point to his court. After being dashed by the waves, he said to his nobles, Know how empty the power of kings is. There is none worthy of the name, but he whom heaven, earth, and sea obey. And then he hung his gold crown on a cross and never wore it again. All honor goes to Christ. All glory goes to Him. So we should live for Him. Someday, Paul tells us He's coming back. That's our hope, and it's true. And when He does, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Philippians 2, verses 10 and 11. Someday you will bow your knee to Jesus Christ and confess Him to be Lord to God's glory. Don't wait until it is forced. Do it now. Willingly. Gladly. He receives all who do. He will receive you at the moment you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And not only that, He'll make you a child of God. He will dress you in righteousness and enable you to live a clean life, the best life. Trust in Him while you can. May God help you to do that if you have not. And all of us, may God help us to be putting off the rags of the old life and wearing the righteousness of Christ. Let's end with one of our favorite hymns in the Red Book. Hymn 104, Come Thou Fount, and then remain standing for the benediction. Hymn 104. Father, we would all confess we're prone to wander. Every day, every minute of the day, but You're a faithful God. You save us. Save your people from the foundation of the earth. You brought them to you in time by the irresistible grace of the Holy Spirit to believe in the atonement that's in the cross and the salvation that's there. And you promised to keep us to the very end. And so when we wander, you come and get us. And we praise you and thank you for that. But Lord, make us faithful that we would serve you well to your glory. Pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.